Now let's talk about another type of diuretic. This one's going to be a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So this carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, we have a lot to talk about. So I'll try and break it down into different portions. So what is um, a carbonic anhydrase, anhydrase inhibitor? Well, the prototypical one is going to be acetazolamide. That is going to be your prototypical acetazolamide. And uh, I want a buzzword here. When, when you think glaucoma, you want to use a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So if you hear a patient has glaucoma, uh, you need to keep this in your arsenal. You need to be thinking possibly a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Uh, that's just the buzzword. Um, let's go into the mechanism of action for these carbonic anhydrase inhibitors because it's good, it's good to see how they work. Um, to begin, we're going to be starting with the normal physiology. Uh, there is a lot going on here. So we'll have quite a few slides. Try and stick with me, uh, and together we will make it. So here's our cell. It's a fat cell because there's a lot going on. We'll need all the space we can get. Here's another cell and another cell down here. Okay, all good. So we're taking a look at, at uh, the cells. So the mechanism of action for our carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is this carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme. And what it is, is it's required for uh, bicarbonate reabsorption, HCO3 reabsorption. And this is going to be found primarily in the proximal convoluted tubule. So the PCT. ECT. So the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, if you've been watching my other videos, here's my glomerulus, PCT, descending, ascending, distal convoluted, and then collecting duct. So we're going to be dealing with the proximal convoluted tubule. And uh, here is the reaction that carbonic anhydrase deals with. We're going to take, uh, we're going to take our, let's see, bicarbonate and we'll be able to form carbon dioxide and water and also note that it is reversible. This enzyme simply takes carbon dioxide and water and changes it into a bicarb form or vice versa. So our carbonic anhydrase, remember I said it's used for bicarb reabsorption and it's also used for uh, bicarbonate formation. Formation and reab absorption. Okay, let's figure out how this all pieces together. I can say this till my face is blue, but if you don't understand, I didn't do my job. So the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Remember it has to deal with uh, the HCl3. So I'm going to get as small of a pen here because we have a lot to fit on. We've got an NaKATPase. I've been talking about this pump for uh, quite a few times now if you've been watching my other videos what it does is it pumps a sodium from inside the cell out and it brings a potassium in I have a video about the ATP or this NAK ATPase uh, so if you don't understand it be sure to watch that video it's going to require ATP so we're actively pumping sodium out and potassium in so we're going to use energy we've also got another uh, another pump, it's going to be a sodium and a hydrogen out. So it's going to be another pump or a channel and it's going to allow sodium to come in because here we're pumping sodium out, it's going to create a vacuum and the sodium is what to going in the vacuum and in the meantime we're pumping out a hydrogen ion. Now that hydrogen ion is out in the lumen. Here's our lumen, here is our inter Interstitial space, interstitial space. So the interstitial space will get reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Anything that's in the lumen will go out in the excretion, so in the urine. So in the meantime, our sodium is coming into the cell and our hydrogen is getting uh, out of the cell. Our hydrogen is going to combine with bicarbonate. So remember, I'm gonna go back 
here we have bicarbonate reabsorption. So this is the reabsorption part. So we have bicarbonate in our, in our filtrate from our glomerular filtrate, so our GFR, and we want to get that bicarbonate back into the blood. We don't like losing bicarbonate. Um, so we're gonna take that hydrogen ion plus this bicarbonate, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. And this is gonna convert uh, the bicarbonate plus a hydrogen ion into H2O plus CO2. Remember, it was this reaction is reversible. However, in the lumen, we're gonna drive it to the formation of water and carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is gonna go into the cell and it's gonna find water that's inside the cell. This is gonna be turned back by carbonic anhydrase found inside the cell. So, and it's gonna be turned into a hydrogen ion and it's gonna be turned into a bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, a bicarbonate. This hydrogen is gonna go back out. So, I mean, we're just looping. We're looping that hydrogen. It likes this cycle. We're not creating hydrogens, we're not losing. This hydrogen will get reused. This bicarbonate, we just simply moved bicarbonate from the lumen into the inside of the cell. Now, we have a, uh, we have a channel here that'll allow us to reabsorb bicarbonate. Um, and then our bicarbonate is now into the interstitial space. Uh, in the interstitial space, it means that it gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream. So we have a uh, sodium hydrogen antiporter on the luminal side. Uh, note that it is dependent on this uh, sodium potassium ATPase. Um, also, we have a symporter, so sodium. So once, once we have this bicarbonate in the cell, we have a symporter to get it back into the interstitial or like the blood, interstitial blood. Um, bloodstream, and that's going to be our sodium uh, bicarbonate symporter. So look at this system. We have carbonic anhydrase enzyme. This is just a normal physiology right now. This is going on right now in your body. We're reabsorbing bicarbonate through carbonic anhydrase. We have a luminal side. That luminal side is actually kind of on the luminal membrane. Uh, it's not just floating around there. No, it's going to be on the luminal side. Uh, we've also got carbonic anhydrase inside the cell. Um, so that's, so that's what's going on right now. Um, if we inhibit this carbonic anhydrase enzyme, I mean, it's right there, but if we inhibit that one, or if we inhibit that one, that's what a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is. That's what the drug does. It inhibits carbonic anhydrase. We're going to lose that bicarbonate that's in the lumen because we're not gonna be able to reabsorb it. We're not gonna be able to turn it into carbon dioxide, turn it into a usable form, turn it back into uh, bicarbonate and then pump it back into the cell. No, we're gonna lose it in the lumen. So if we inhibit carbonic anhydrase, we're gonna decrease blood HCO3, bicarbonate. So we're gonna lose part of that buffer system. Let's, uh, let's continue on here. Uh, we've got a little more to go. So we just covered the bicarbonate reabsorption. But back here, I said uh, it's also carbonic anhydrase is used for uh, bicarbonate formation. So let's cover that portion really quick. There's two different two different mechanisms for uh, that. So we've got our cell still, same cell. Uh, we've got a HPO3, change my size here, HPO3. Uh, we've got an H. PO3. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking water so that's inside the cell naturally. We're going to be cleaving it into two products, an OH and an H. So we're going to take that hydrogen ion. It's going to leave the cell. It's going to form, or it's going to combine with uh, HPO3. It's going to form H2PO4 negative. We're going to lose that phosphate group that gets lost in the in the urine. So this is lumen. This is going to be interstitial. So same process. Our HPO3 
forms with that hydrogen ion that's formed that gets pumped out of the cell. And, uh, and now we're going to be dealing with this OH. Carbonic and hydrase enzyme is still present in the cell, and then that can catalyze the reaction OH plus CO2. Cells produce CO2 and combines those to form bicarbonate, H3, HCO3, the bicarbonate is formed. That is formation. Formation, not spelling, because my spelling is horrible. That is formation. So we just formed some bicarbonate using, uh, we, by losing a phosphate in the process. Also, we've got a, another cell. By a similar mechanism, uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking uh, amino acids and metabolism in general. And we're going to have some products. We're going to have some products of metabolism and uh, amino acid breakdown. And some of those products are going to be NH4 and a hydroxide ion. So this NH4 will get converted into NH3 and hydrogen ion. They'll leave the cell. They'll reform back into NH4. Our body doesn't like nitrogens because um, our, our body doesn't like nitrogens. I'll leave it at that. So we're going to get rid of the nitrogen. However, we are going to deal with uh, we are going to deal with this hydroxide again. Remember, we just covered it. We just turned to hydroxide. Use some carbonic anhydrase. So we're going to take that CO2 formed by metabolism of the body. We're going to use carbonic anhydrase enzyme. We're going to form an HCO3 that is going to leave the cell into the interstitium again. So as a net result, we get rid of and H4, we add, we add um, HCO3 to our stockpile. Before we got rid of a phosphate, we gained a bicarbonate. Now we're getting rid of a nitrogen and we're gaining a bicarbonate. Either one is involved in bicarbonate formation. Okay, so that's some of the mechanisms of action. We talked about the bicarbonate formation, we talked about the bicarbonate reabsorption. So let's talk about the use. The use of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So let's, let's look back here. Uh, if we inhibit this carbonic anhydrase enzyme, we don't form the bicarbonate. And likewise, we're not able to form bicarbonate if we, if we, uh, if we inhibit this carbonic anhydrase. So why would we use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors? Well, it's going to increase solutes in the urine or in the in the luminal side. So we in lumen. So what happens? We're going to increase the bicarb HCO3 in the lumen. And what this is is this is going to go to the macula the macula densa. The macula densa cells and that's going to uh, increase solutes in the lumen and as those solutes pass by the macula densa they'll be sensing the solute level passing by it and if you have increased solute levels uh, you'll have decreased renal blood flow because you don't want to uh, you don't want to be peeing stuff off if you have increased solute levels you'll want to save conserve water so you'll have decreased renal blood flow as a result also increased bicarbonate uh, in the urine excretion causes uh, increased secretion of sodium, potassium, and chloride. And so where bicarbonate goes, these go. And where these go, water goes. So when you get rid of bicarbonate, you'll also get rid of these ions. And when you get rid of these ions, water will go through its osmotic gradient and thus you diurese, you lose water. So we'll go back to the uses. I didn't really talk about the uses. So we have the diuretic. It's used as a diuretic. So kidney. Also remember at the very beginning of this lecture, I talked about glaucoma. Increased pressure of the eye. So uh, 
Carbonic anhydrase is found in the ciliary body. You know, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, um, not really used as diuretics. Uh, this is where they're really used in ophthalmology and eye management. The ciliary body of the eye is going to produce uh, aqueous humor. So the aqueous humor is going to go to the anterior chamber and it's going to make its way around the iris and then eventually drain. However, in glaucoma, you make all this aqueous humor, but you can't drain it, so you increase interocular pressure, the interior chamber pressure. So you would use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors to block the carbonic anhydrase found in the ciliary body. So you're going to decrease the production of aqueous humor, thus relieving the symptoms. Also, you're going to use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors in altitude sickness. So for the treatment of altitude sickness, well, you're, you're scratching your head thinking, how in the, does that work? So let's, let's go over that really quick. The choroid plexus, the choroid plexus. So if, let's go back to anatomy and physiology. Uh, the choroid plexus is involved in the development of cerebral spinal fluid, and it's found in the ventricles. So the choroid plexus contains carbonic anhydrase as well. Ciliary body contains carbonic anhydrase, your kidney contains carbonic anhydrase, your choroid plexus in the development of cerebral spinal fluid contains carbonic anhydrase. So in altitude sickness, if you go up to altitude, there's decreased oxygen in the air. And you can get symptoms of hypoxia when you have altitude sickness. So you're thinking, still don't see the connection. Okay, so if you have decreased cerebral spinal CSF. So we give a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It's going to decrease the carbonic anhydrase that's found in your choroid plexus. So you're going to get decreased cerebral spinal fluid production. This is going to increase your ventilation rate because you're going to form a metabolic acidosis. If you decrease your carbonic anhydrase, you're going to decrease your CSF you're going to decrease your bicarbonate as well. This all creates a metabolic acidosis. This metabolic acidosis will increase your ventilation rate, and that increased ventilation rate will increase your breathing. You'll try and get more O2. You'll have less hypoxia, so you'll have increased O2 saturation uh, in the blood. You'll you'll have to breathe in more to get more oxygen of increased oxygen. Uh, and then also, uh, it can also be used as a means to increase urine pH. So it increases the urine pH. And what it does, it's going to trap acids in the urine. So remember, uh, if you give carbonic anhydrase to the kidney, you're going to lose the bicarbonate into the urine. Bicarbonate is a base. Uh, it's going to trap acids, so if you have weak acids in the urine, weak acid acid is going to interact with the base, it's going to trap it in the urine, and um, that way these weak acids cannot get reabsorbed. So it'll alkalinize the urine, that way you can trap some weak acids in the urine, and then they'll be excreted instead of reabsorbed. So that's the very basics of carbonic anhydrase. This is one of the more uh, important and more complex drugs to understand because all of its different functions and its different uses, it creates, it absorbs uh, bicarbonate and it's used primarily in glaucoma treatment.